Hi, everybody. This is the Post Movie Podcast. I'm st- <laughs> You're drunk on coffee. <laughs> this is the Post Movie Podcast. I'm Steve Head. I'm John Black. And it just spiked again. It just spiked. I was just like, I'm not going to spike was it your the voice audio. Or mine? It was me. No, it was mine. It was mine. But you know what? You're I'm going to leave it. too big for this. Your I'm going to. too big. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it. You have important things to say and you're going to shout. Mm. <laughs> on this episode, we're going to talk about the new Hammer film. The Woman in Black. Dee, 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 the Woman in Black. Yeah. And then we're going to talk about Chronicle, or John's going to talk about Chronicle, because the way my life worked this week, I was not able to see it. So. So, what, all right, but what's your excuse for missing the big miracle? Uh, huh? Oh, right, right. The you, other movie opening this week is The Big Miracle. You, you call yourself a critic. With Newton Boy, John Krasinski, and who else is in that movie? Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore. Oh, Kristen that's why Bell. she's doing her interviews right now. Um, she's uh, talking about being a mom and having babies. Ugh, it's hot. No, <laughs> you know, I've never the 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 director of this movie really went out of his way to make her look unappealing. Yeah, she's like a shrew with the worst hair. Get you know you it's, about the whales. I keep thinking back to this. Uh, I did I did a press conference with Jessica Alba. And most of us were all there because she's so damn hot, right? So well, yeah. She gets in to start talking about mommies and being a mom and having babies. And it was just well, like... You can feel your little turtle tugging. Oh, I'm feeling the pain right now. <laughs> As I'm okay. sure people listening to this are. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> the big miracle. You yeah, saw it? You saw oh, it today? Yeah. No, I went last Saturday with the other kids. Oh. It's awful. It'll probably make a ton of money. It'll make a ton of money in the well, whole... Well, is it's it a, a, what is it? A Disney flick? Yeah. The thing, like it's... The way I no, it's universal actually, yeah. but it's a it's a feel good movie about whales that's being released on school vacation week. That that's why they made it. You gotta do this for the kids, you know. No. You gotta make movies. The kids that would be happy bring seeing families to the theater. Um, I don't know something else. I just I don't look at film through that. I have to remind myself that there's the that other the there's that other audience. I don't look through at movies through the paradigm of. A family. I don't. I don't go you know, to like those what's appropriate party because ones. I'll see anything. Yeah, no, you except won't. for <laughs> yeah, big miracle. Don't say that. Well, that's true. Yeah. Now, did you have? Was, did life take over? Did you just say big miracle? Fuck it, I'm not going. Oh no, last I think last Saturday I was sleeping. Nah, so was I. But I was so, at the theater at 10 a.m. Yeah, uh, and then uh, on Tuesday when we had the press screening for Chronicle, which I really wanted to go to, but. I decided to do work. I mean, I, I was I was actually pretty prolific this week. I think I think the other reason I didn't go see Chronicle, which kind of sucked, was um, for me anyways. I didn't want to make two trips into the city. I mean, I mean, I did. I for for those for those of you who uh, are listening for the first time, uh, John lives south of Boston. Yes, I live Quincy. west of Boston. Probably it's like a. 20, 25 minute T ride, something like that. But you know, there were there were a couple of you know, I just didn't want to go back and forth from the city. So oh, I'm just baby. like, I'm gonna make my one trip in tonight and we're gonna go see uh Woman in Black. The Woman in Black, and then if I catch Chronicle, you know, I'll catch it. I could st- I just couldn't do the back and forth thing. You know? Couldn't do it. Everything yeah, is not innuendo, John. Oh, really? Because I was trying to think of a joke. <laughs> I'm a little slow today too. Usually I have the joke out before you can stop me. Um, so I, let's wrap it up. Big miracle. <laughs> it's not worth seeing the thing. It's based on a true story. It's about these whales who get stuck under the ice yeah. and they've got like one little hole to breathe through. Cause you know, whales need to breathe and the That's town, how I feel in a movie theater. Sometimes. Yeah. The town gets together and they come up with a plan. They, they dig other holes through the ice and lead the whales out to where a Russian trawler breaks through the iceberg and then sets them free. Okay, whatever. It's based on a true story. And there is plenty of documentary footage in the film. Mm. Why didn't they just make a documentary? Because the film they make, the whales look fake. The Alaska they're in looks like it's on a sound stage. No one's no whales. breath. It's it's fifty below, but you can't see their breath. I think this was like they what, they filmed it in Canada, right? No, like they filmed there, it on right? a back lot in Hollywood, I swear. They never went to Canada, and they, they barely go outside in this movie. And the whales look like they were cut out of styrofoam, and there's just some guy on the other end pushing the lever down. You can kind of tell from the commercials. Oh. The other thing I'm getting from the commercial is that, like, you know, John Krasinski is always going to he, – he's he's going to be like this – always be this straight-up nice guy. And I guess ultimately that's a good thing. Like, all right. of his, like, like he's a 
because of his character Jim on The Office, he he has like he has an Elliot Ness quality. He's always going to be like a straight up nice guy, you know. Right. Except when he's pushed to the limit. Yeah, and he has to save the whales. <laughs> um, yeah, this you know I I said in my review that uh, you know kids kids under the age of five would probably like it. They yeah. don't care that you know do Barrymore's a bitchy shrew from PETA and um, the whales look fake and it's just terrible. It's just terrible. <laughs> you know, when you say things like that, I just see the type appearing on the poster. Yeah. <laughs> this is terrible. Drew Barrymore's a bitchy shrew from PETA. Yeah. It's just terrible. Well, it's typed in my review. I don't think it'll make it to the poster, but. Huh. Um, How many words do you do when you do a, like an online review where you where, where, do, you, where do you keep it? You I just write keep to it until like, you go? Yeah, I try to keep it under 500 words. I thought you had to do like, I thought your, your reviews were like capsule reviews. No. Like, There's no limitations online. I can just go on. As people who listen to this well, show yeah, know, but, but I can go on and on Historically, and on the way you've on. written, like like if you were going to write a review for the Metro, how mm-hmm. many words you well, got? Well, Metro, uh, if you got 250 words, you were, you know, taking up a lot of space. Yeah. And that was for the lead review. Everything else would be a 50 to 150 word capsule. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, always- and they don't even, do they even do that anymore? What are, I don't know do you, what do you pay do. attention to it? this? This is, this is relevant for, for John. And uh, again, backstory people, he used to edit the Boston, Met, uh, yeah, Boston was, Metro, yeah. which is a, which is a, um, publication that, uh, you get on the T or around, you it's know, free Boston paper, downtown. Yeah. It's the, one of the free papers here. The other one being the Phoenix yeah. the other, and the other, other one being the dig. Right, but um, how long, how long did you do that for? This Couple is my years. my John interview. Couple years, yeah. um, and the great thing was the publisher loved movies because they sold a ton of movie ads in the, when we were there. So my Their focus was always Friday on edition of the of the of the Metro is big picture from current film. Right, that's what they do. Yeah, yeah, they don't care. You know, um, we used to always cover movies. You know, that was my main thing. Friday, I'd have a section that would be 10 to 12 pages. Now they've got three, and one of them's movie. The rest is like a gossip page and then the crossword. Yeah. So, um, but gossip, yeah. But I the, find, go ahead. Sorry. But, but the paper, the publication I wrote before that was AOL's Digital City, and it was the internet. You could just go on and on and on. So I would write 800,000-word reviews. 800,000-word 800, reviews? 800,000, yes. 800 Holy to 1,000. No, 800,000 words. I would just review one movie every six months. And so I went to, um, when I went to Metro, they were like, no, you, you can only have, you know, I need this 200 words. Two, I can't do that. You learn you can pretty easily, you know. Yeah. Um, and now I'm back at Event Guide and I can do what I want, but I keep it to around 500. No reason to go beyond that. Yeah. I was really stretching doing the Charlotte Rampling movie to get 300 words. Man, that's another one so, I wanted to see. I just... It's been an off week for you, buddy. Yeah, it was. Not DVD-wise, though. Uh, yeah. Movie, Movie-wise, movie yeah, you know, it yeah. was. I'd intended to see the Studio Ghibli films last night at the MFA, and I and I couldn't make it. You know, man, life just gets in the way. And I, and I use that as an excuse every time that I don't get to see a movie that I want to see. Life I, you got to flip it around and say, I know I was supposed to do that, but I went to yeah. movies instead. You know, yeah. I know I was supposed to feed the baby, but I went to a double feature. Man, I want to see uh, uh, Morver and Keller tonight at Harvard. The what? The Morver and Keller. It's a 2003 film starring, God, what's her name from Sweet and Low Down? Oh, you know that God. God. Uh, I can't remember. She was the alien. She, she was the predictor Come on. Come lady. On. Oh, in, don't uh, cheat. Don't look online. Yeah, I'm looking Samantha online. Morton. Very good. Thank Very you. good, John. She is uh, a darling. Yes. And uh, one of her films that I haven't seen is uh, Morver and Keller. I got to hang with her, man. I was so at um, at Toronto two years ago. Yeah. She just, we were in the, Sarah and I were just hanging out in the, um, I don't know, one of the, one of the press hospitality areas yeah. upstairs and, uh, um, she came in and, uh, uh, I, I think she was going to do a photo shoot or something like that, but, um, started talking with us perfectly personable, nothing, uh, made up about her. In fact, she wasn't even wearing makeup <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, 
I, I think she had just like gone to the festival on her own. She was literally like there by herself. Yeah. And uh, I recall later that night she went to one of the, she showed up at one of the parties and did a karaoke thing at one of the uh, <laughs> internet parties. And I think she just like became then and there eternally beloved by the fanboys. You know? They were already spanking it to her. So why not? <laughs> now, now I know she's a, she's a nice person too. Huh. Oh, she's, she's, she's a little nutty. Did, um, She's a little nutty, but you know who's the she, chick who was in yeah. Drive? I forget. You know the, the blonde from she was in Shame. Jessica Chastain. No, no, I'm getting it wrong. Drive, Drive, yeah. And she was in Shame. <sighs> Back to the internet he goes. Yeah, Fingers we can do this all across day. the keyboards. Can you hear that, people? That's Steve thinking. Carrie Mulligan. Yes. Christina Hendricks. Carrie Mulligan. Okay. I think. Um, Samantha Morton and Carrie Mulligan should do a remake of Black Widow just for the lesbian scene. I'd pay for it. I'm th I'm already running it in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I can't wait to see her in uh, – what's that movie she's doing with Baz Luhrmann? I think she's doing like um, uh, The Great Gatsby. Oh, God. With um, DiCaprio. Yeah. Can't wait to see that. I've seen a few photos from I, it. I didn't like the original movie. That book annoys me. <laughs> So I think it's because it was one of the things you had to read in high school. You know uh -huh. those books they make you read? Great Gatsby was one of them. And yeah. At that time, I hated it, and I still do. It's probably a fine book. Yeah, she yeah. plays um, his lady, Daisy Buchanan. Yes. Looking forward to that. We got way off base. It's all right. The hell are we we're, talking we're about? just killing time. We've only got the one movie to review. So <laughs> we're just eating up this Well, here. tell me about uh, Chronicle, please. I mean... I really wanted to see this. I did not know anything about this movie until, until like last week. Yeah. And, you know, and I saw the, you know, I think I, I think I checked out the trailer like earlier in the morning and I was like, man, if I can make it out, I can go. But I just If life just doesn't didn't. stop me from taking a 20 minute train ride. John, it's back and forth and back and forth. And you end up. Between the city. <laughs> so. Um, it's, it, it has three, it's a, the three words I dread for a movie, found footage film. I don't have a problem with found footage. And, I, well, I do if it's just lazy filmmaking. If they're making it found footage because they, they're not talented enough to do anything else. So, like, in, um, what was the thing I just saw? The Amityville 3 or 4, whatever it is, from um, Asylum? That's a, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's that's a found somewhere. footage film, and it's because they had no budget and no talent. So, they'd show a guy at the top of the stairs, and, oh, the camera would shut off, and then he'd be at the bottom of the stairs dead. It'd be like, you can't even film him going down. Did you like the movie? I mean, I haven't seen it yet. No. No, it was yeah. bad. Yeah. It was bad. Even for Asylum, it was bad. Question. Yes. Did you get to watching Two-Headed Shark Attack? No. Not yet. Oh, uh, okay. No. Right. I've just had so many things to watch just for this week. I haven't been around to it. <laughs> okay. Chronicle. Um. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's his found footage film, but that barely matters. It's three guys who, um, <laughs> they find a sinkhole, they climb in it. There's some kind of alien thing down there that infects them with something that gives them super telekinetic powers. And so I imagine this as being like they now have escape from Witch Mountain powers. Pretty much, yeah. Except yeah. like really amped up. Well, they, they um at first every time they try to use it, they get nosebleeds and pass out. But as they they oh, continue to use like... the power, they get stronger. But the, one of the, them, I'm sorry, the what? Is, the more they use it, the more they use the power, the stronger they. It becomes, and they get to control it more. So at first, they're just like making girl skirts blow up, you know. And, you Zapped. Know, just, yeah. There, there is a funny scene where they, uh, they're they at a toy store, and they have a toy bear chase a little girl. <laughs> it's pretty thought, funny. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about that. This could be sort of a play on the Willie Ain. What, what was It was Zapped. It was Scott Baio and... Whoever else was Scott Baio. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, one, the one kid in the movie, the, the one who was a twisted loner, before he had powers. Twisted loner. Twisted loner. Not like he was playing Twister. No. Okay. He, wasn't a tw he played Twister by himself. He was a Twister right. loner. Right. Twisted. Yes. Um, when he gets the power, it's my he goes, I fucking love Twister. And it's okay. also my favorite coffee cup. But go. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so the, the Twisted loner becomes a Twisted loner with superpowers and gets revenge on, his, uh, on the people who've done him wrong. So the story's not too strong, but the battle... The last third in the movie is a fight between two of the guys that, like, you know, it's like Godzilla and Megalon fighting over Toy Tokyo, except it looks real. 
Hmm. And suddenly this handheld... I really want to see it. Suddenly this handheld held found footage movie becomes pretty slick. You know, mm -hmm. flying around, beating the crap out of each other. Um, so it was a lot of fun. It's not a great movie, but it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Would you say it's better than Cloverfield? In yeah, the found Cloverfield footage? annoyed me. Mm. But Cleavage Field delighted me. <laughs> I didn't know there was one. You know, um, God bless the folks at Skinamax. That was that was their uh, soft core takeoff of Cloverfield. Did they send you movies? No, I used to have Cinemax. Uh I wish they did, because I just had to get rid of Cinemax because it cost them too much money. Uh, but, um, no, I didn't like Cloverfield. Hmm. That, that's the kind of handheld stuff that annoys me, you know? Yeah. Just, so, uh, yeah, uh, Chronicle was fun. I wouldn't go back. There's no reason to see it again. It's pretty yeah, I'm just uh, I'm annoyed that I didn't get the chance to see it, but, uh, it, but it was all in a good cause. Good. I, I worked. I edited, and I got multiple podcasts out this week. You know, right. something's got to give. Something's got to give, and sometimes it's movies. Like I said, flip it around. <laughs> Put movies, make movies your priority. Shall we move on to the woman in black? Yeah, this won't take long. <laughs> John, you, I'm just like wh that. Just telegraphs to me that you're not into this movie, and I want to say I, that as far as like uh, a movie that establishes, you know, has a lot of ambiance, and um, you know, I, if we if I can liken it quickly to the innkeepers mm -hmm. where there's sort of what's going on screen is what I would call some, you know, it's like ghost play. They're playing with the ghost. So the ghost is playing with them. Right. This, uh, the woman in black is, is not scary, right? but it's got like these moments that are just kind of like fun, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a creepy way with the way that the ghost creeps around. So uh, it's not a scary movie, but I, but I found it fun. But tell, tell I wanted me. to interject that just no, no, no. right Why off the bat. Tell the readers what it's about or the listeners. He's a, a lawyer in North England. Uh, you know, it's northern near the Northern Moors. It's near the Moors. Yes, it's very misty. Like there's London, Edinburgh, and in between it's just this mud field where, you know, dirty people live. Radcliffe plays a lawyer who's coming up there to settle the finances of this rich lady who died. And Mysteriously. Um, yeah. Or is it? Do we even know how she died? Um, oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, <laughs> quite well. I guess I, I must have napped. Yeah. Um, she uh, was very much vexed by the violent death of her son. Not exceptionally violent, but certainly uh, disturbing death a mud of her. Hole. Yes. In, in the, I, I don't even know what, what you call this uh, tide-like area. It's like this netherland between Marsh? the land and the and the and the sometimes island. Yeah. And uh, her child was drowned in this uh, uh, in the tide there, and she was so dis so disturbed by it that um, and felt it so unfair to her that uh, she lives in her ghostly presence to kill other children. So the children of this town have been one by one disappearing, and as he's as Daniel Radcliffe's character has come there to. Um, you know, settle this estate. He's he also explores, um, you know, what's going on with this uh, this woman, and it's like the one guy. There's one guy in town who's friendly to him, you know, and and that's uh, Kieran Hines, and he's the guy that kind of knows what's going on with the estate, and um, he has Daniel Daniel Radcliffe over for dinner one night, and we meet his wife, coincidentally played by um, uh, what's her name, Janet, Janet McTeague, mm -hmm. yeah. is that? Right. McTeague, McTeer. McTeer. McGoogle. McTeer. McTeague. McDonald. I should know. She's been uh, louder for her performance in Albert Knobs. And here she's having a good time playing this freaky lady who's possessed by the spirit of her dead son. Hmm. And hmm. Uh, it's it's creepy. Not scary, though. There's the also... Um, What's important to the backstory is that Daniel Radcliffe has a son who he's going to who he has left in the care of a nanny for a week or so while he goes up to solve what's up with this uh, uh, estate. The, it's every time they're in, he goes into this house. This is like a creepy. I don't I don't know when this movie takes place. It's, it's like cars it's like, have like just around. become a thing. So it's like nineteen ten, yeah, something, something like that. that. And uh, this is just the creepiest house. And the mother, the dead mother of this dead child had given her son the creepiest fucking toys. I mean, mm. there's like these, these, 
just you know old victorian to toys that are just like like molding and the way they're photographed in such a way is to like make their eyes look all ominous and evil and overbearing yeah. and uh i think it's just like what what i found fun about this movie was uh the ghost play that's going on in the house you know whenever whenever the ghost makes its presence known that's just creepy to me that's just you know it's just for the fun of it i mean i think it's also important to say that uh, you know this is this is a hammer film and hammer you know they have the incredible history of um gothic horror films yeah, that that yeah. are really more for adults you know there's there's the sexual angle you know there's the real there's the you know there's real hammers and stakes and blood flying yeah. and coffins and stuff like that but the women in women in black is nothing like that it's no. it's like hammer light it's fun uh in terms of hammer there's nothing sexy about it yeah <laughs> it's just some um you know the theater just got so quiet like drop a pin quiet in these uh scenes where Radcliffe's uh you know, in the hallway of the house and the ghost is there or, or in her, uh, in the, chi in the kid's playroom, you know, with the rocking right, chair. Right. It's, you know, creepy stuff like that. Yeah. Know? I didn't, I, I think not the, scary um, though. My favorite thing know. about the movie was the set design yeah. of the house. Um, but it never really even felt old to me. It was like, it's like when you go on uh, the haunted house ride and Disney, you know, they do, they, they put spider webs and they make it look all creepy, but you know, it's fake. They tried everything in the book to make this house look creepy to me, and I knew it was they, fake. Yeah, I mean, the tons of – I don't know how long it's been since this woman had passed away, but it was long enough for the entire foyer of her house to be just covered in the thickest spider webs. Yeah, yeah. But, and then um, I know it's kind of a transition film for Radcliffe to go from Harry Potter to maybe more grown-up stuff. Yeah. So, you know, and, and because they want to take his fan base, they make this PG-13 so nothing really bad happens. Yeah. Um, but we, we've always mentioned this for horror movies. There has to be a sense of humor. No humor here. It was just all somber, dour, boring for me. Hmm. The ghost scenes you were talking about, the way they were shot, you know, it's like, oh, here's, you know, but it's, it's a close up. It is, it is creepy. Yeah. But it's creepy when you see like a little kid ghost from like a hundred years ago. I just thought you it know. was a prop. This, this, um, so this, this ghost, this lady, she's just, she's not like a regular ghost. She has this ability to be able to somehow influence living children to kill themselves. Yeah. And when she appears, when the woman in black appears, uh, it's like, it's like a ghost sighting. And, uh, somehow, you know, anybody who's seen the ghost knows that something bad is going to happen to a child. Right. Very soon. And apparently, since Daniel Radcliffe has seen her, he has this like extra perception or something. Like he's, uh, people believe he's supposed to know when the next murder is going to happen or something like that. And mm. I don't know, I yeah. don't know. But 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 it's creepily filmed, and and the the character of the ghost is uh, you know sort of neat herself. But really, it's about like creaky hallways and uh, doors opening and closing by themselves and uh, quick cuts to the ghost appearing. And they're very cre I loved that scene where the ghost was, you saw her face in, face in the rocking chair. Yeah. Another film does this better. It's the innkeepers, which opens. Today but, 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 but what I liked about this is, was, is that as opposed to the innkeepers, which is questionable about its haunt, this is an actual ghost. And, you know, I just think the ghostly stuff is cool. So yeah, no, nope. I just it for thought me. it was all pretty predictable, and the pacing was really bad. Lack of humor. Radcliffe is plays the plays the guy with one note. He's sad. You know, he's sad everything, and I understand that because his wife died, and he's about to lose his job, yes. and all this um, stuff. Uh, yes, he's backstory got a lot there. On his his wife died in childbirth. He's got a lot on his plate, but he's just dour through the whole thing. Um, and the ending was silly. So I just, I hate it when people yell stuff out in the theater. Oh, that you know dickhead I mean? that, in front that of us? dick that, uh, like, ugh. This is his two seconds of fame for yeah. 300 people in a the theater. Hmm. Yeah, I just, this did nothing for me. You know, it was I the like, kind of film, though, that the tension was really great. I mean, there was really – I think that, like, everybody in the theater was really riveted to the screen. They, they The director had us, which was fun. It has uh, a large – capacity for fun with the ghost stuff but there's no fun in the movie though 
There's it's, no spirit it's, of fun it's in it. Just the playing around with the ghost. See, you know? what you saw at his tension, I found to be tedium. Um, just well, waiting just and waiting two different for perspectives. a loud noise to startle us. It's it, and then, like when this one guy coughed in the theater, everybody just laughed because it broke the tension. I think it was more. That's an example of how they had you startling you know? than scaring. You know, loud no every every yeah, but every isn't it creepy as shit? Where like you know, Daniel Radcliffe is in, in uh, you know in the foreground of the screen, and all of a sudden, way down in the back at the end of the hall, she appears, and you know she's going. Yeah, to but do that's it. creepy shit. I love that. See, that's that's fine. I just I'm um, I think it's just boring and the fact that they crank the music up on the soundtrack to shock you into it that's cheap that's a cheap effect i don't need that i want something that's honestly going to scare me okay what's a uh, question john yes. favorite ghost movie what what favorite fucked you ghost up ghost movie yeah ghost ghostly stuff like ghostly appearance movie you know what i mean like like the two little girls in the shining did that mess with you that's creepy shit yeah that's creepy shit okay um, what uh, works for you? Little, was it Beautiful Creatures? Little Creatures? What was the one with um Kate Winslet? Yeah, that was creepy. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't really. I don't think that was a ghost film, was it? Mm. I don't know. I just remember being creeped out by it. Okay. Um, I don't really think of too many ghost movies. There's one with um. Oh. God, remember that movie Ghost with uh Patrick Swayze? That wasn't scary. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Christ. It was like with John Hausman or something. Or no, Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire did a ghost flick in the early eighties. Yeah. I guess I don't I don't think, you know, empty rockers are that scary. Oh. You know. Do you remember the movie Insidious last year? Did you like that? No, I didn't. Oh, I thought that was a joke. I know you liked it a yeah, lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, they. I think this just go goes in, and, or listeners can go back and and listen to us bitch about that. I movie. think you just don't like ghost movies, man. I mean, because if you I, did, you'd be digging like paranormal stuff and paranormal activity no, stuff. You know, I mean, no, no. no, they. I just find that you know, I thought women in the woman in black was really formulaic. And they stuck pretty close to the formula. They didn't try to stretch it beyond the the accepted or the expected. Hmm. You know, so nothing. But you know. I I really like the innkeepers. Okay, you know, and I was that because of her. No, was that because of the lady? No, no, not completely. What's her name again? Sarah Paxton. Yeah. No, I thought there was a great sense of humor. They were characters. Those are characters I cared about, and what was going to happen to them. Which, by the way, the innkeepers is playing midnight tonight at the Coolidge. Didn't I hope they in, keep doing it again. More I think more it innkeepers in uh, today. At the Coolidge. Oh, like full open in theater. So. Hmm. Yeah. But that's just it. I, a, a good, any good movie has to take the time to give you characters. You're going to care about what happens to them. I didn't care about Radcliffe. You know? I didn't. Well, this is his first post Harry uh, Potter. What was his first Harry, post Harry Potter oh, film? Oh, he did it. He did a really, um, he's done a couple of crappy, like, indie what? movies that never saw the light of day. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm wrong. But, you know, at least this one got into theaters. You know, he's done a lot. He's done. It's like the guy who played played uh, Ron Weasley doing Thunderpants. You know, they they have their little side projects that they try to cash in on. But did you hear, see that uh, interview that Daniel Radcliffe did this week with a London newspaper where he admitted he was drunk during some of the filming some of the scenes in Harry Potter, no. where the, the, he admitted that he's has a drinking problem and that he he wasn't drinking while at work on Harry Potter, but he was drinking like almost all the time, like, while not. And so he was actually drunk during some of the scenes. And he says that he can pinpoint the scenes he knows in which he was inebriated while filming. <laughs> <laughs> I automatically, like, impose innocence upon everyone. So to me, this is like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know? I mean, he said, he said, I think, in his defense that he um, he's insecure. He's, like, constantly insecure, but it, he... You know, like a lot of actors, they use that as uh, energy to do you know right. better performance. And well, that, the good news, but is I'm just kind of like, whoa! He was only drunk you know? during the first movie when he was 12. He sobered up by the third movie and you know moved on. Right. So we can assume there was some deathly hollow scenes uh, with an inebriated Mr. Potter. Maybe. I guess. You don't think um, Richard Harris was drunk when he did it? Possibly. Yeah. And Maybe I, that's where you know, he got it I from. I think. Um, that's one of my great 
Harry Potter memories was, was getting to be able to meet Richard Harris. Yeah. Did you do the Harry Potter stuff a while back? I didn't do the trip to London, but I did. I talked to him in New York. Yeah. So, and it was Richard Harris doing his interviews in a red velvet bathrobe, which I thought was just so cool. <laughs> and he was delightful to talk yeah. to. And he died um, a couple of years later. Yeah. But they've never connected me with it. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has that happened to you with? Is that um, a curiosity? Well, you know, I was going to save it for DVDs, but Ben Gazzara died yesterday. Yeah. And I interviewed him. Yeah. But again, they've never drawn, they've never connected those two dots. <laughs> I I wish I could kill some careers of the people I talk with, but <laughs> they're only helping mine, so I can't really be that negative. So I would suggest, you know, I think, like I, I said in my review, I think it's a good transitional movie for the Potter bands, the Radcliffe Fians, whatever they call themselves. Um, but it's not for adults. I want to ask you, were you able to get in over to the MFA to see any of the uh, Studio Ghibli flicks nope. this week? Not yet. Damn, I wrote man. about them. But, um, That's going on through the 19th. And there was Howl's Moving Castle was last night. You know, I couldn't make it, really wanted to. I just saw Howl's Moving Castle a few weeks ago. Yeah. And it's good, but it's we talked about this before when we were watching anime. Do you prefer subtitled or dubbed? Since we saw Full Metal Alchemist right. last week at the MFA, dubbed. I've kind of been. It's the dubbed as much as I as much as I like the original Japanese and stuff. The dubbed it's just easily accessible for right, me. Right, you know what I mean. Plus, it also depends on the screen size for me because, mm -hmm. like, when I, if I'm watching something on a small screen, I'd prefer not to read subtitles on a small screen. Right. It's not to say that I don't prefer subtitles, but I like my subtitles when they aren't a pain in the ass. Yeah, you know? and I think. The Japanese language sometimes sounds harsh to my ears. Yeah. And I know I'm not getting any of the nuance you get out of a performance you can understand the language. Yeah. So they could be yelling or sweet talking or telling a joke, and it's not going to come across as well as if I hear actors do it. But with Howl's Moving Castle, that was one of the first times I heard them use big name talent. So you've right. got Billy Crystal as the voice of the magic fire. And I thought that was annoying as hell. I like you, you English, like, uh, but I like right. English people who I don't know. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, you know, I, I, you listen to enough or you watch enough uh, anime from Funimation and you start to recognize voices because it's the same troop of, car troop of actors who dub uh -huh. se you know, series after series. The Elric brothers sound that way to me because that's how I've always heard them were those voices. You know, I don't watch Full Metal right. Alchemist subtitled. So in a week or two, we've got um, The Secret World of Arity, which is yeah, the next the Studio one. Ghibli film. And I think like Amy Poehler, Will Arnett. Yeah. Um, I don't recall it's other names. finding the right voice to be an animated character is a delicate balance. You know, I kind of, I wasn't digging Ponyo for that reason because yeah. you knew that it was Matt Damon. And Lee you know, Mason. you knew it was, yeah. And, and um, you know, Miss 30 Rock, what's her name? Tina Fey. Right. I couldn't, you know, separate the image of Ponyo's mom from Tina Fey. Right, right. I mean, I know that this is how a studio sells, sells tickets, but it's just better to go the route of the of the voice meeting the character, and who cares if the person is uh, famous? I mean, yeah. Brad do you Pitt. think D Disney was going to have trouble selling Ponyo because uh, Matt Damon wasn't in it? Oh. You know, voice wasn't there, you know? When um, I think I like I mean, Brad I think that they think that they would. I like Brad Pitt as an actor, but I hate him doing animated movies. Yeah. You know, because it's his voice. You just hear his voice and you don't see him. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't make the disconnect I need. Well, he has a, he has a very distinctive uh, voice. Yeah, but and so does Liam Neeson. Yeah. And um, Billy Crystal. You know, suddenly suddenly the fire in Howl's Magic Castle is a old Jewish comic. How did they take The Secret World of Arity and have Disney release it in the U.S. as being directed by Gary Rydstrom. What, what is this? The voice talent was directed by Gary Rydstrom? Or yeah. How, uh, the, the voice talent was produced by Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy? I mean, is that, well, I mean take, are they um, re-editing the film or something? I don't get it. Yeah, they'll take, well, they rewrite the story for American audiences. So it's actually a re-edit. Well, it's not total, but, you know, they'll, they'll tweak it and then they redirect, you know, the voices still have to match the mouths, but they'll add... You know, they'll make it more Americanized. Um, and that's one of the reasons purists want to see them subtitled, because, you know, the movie that's two and a half hours in Japan may be 90 minutes in the U.S., hmm. you know, or 
you know, so they keep and then they cut out references. That well, no. there there is absolute truth to the fact that if you release a subtitled movie and it's just not going to make as much money as you know a movie that isn't. Right. I mean, they've known this for fifty, sixty you know, years in Hollywood longer. You know what I mean? That's the the, the story of Godzilla. Is also a story about how releasing Godzilla with subtitles in the U.S. won't make the kind of money as refilming scenes and releasing it with, you know... Raymond Burr is Steve Raymond Martin. Burr, mm-hmm. yes. It's the same kind of thing where they can take that, they can take an animated movie from Japan and give it the Godzilla treatment, add stuff. But it's not mm-hmm. as easy because you have to match the drawing style, you know, so they just do it with story, I guess. Hmm. You know, they can't just film Raymond Burr and then cut in the scenes of Godzilla. You know, in a way, to me, it just just feels like sacrilege. But you're making money on it, you know, sacrilege, so what? Yeah, um, well, Dragon Ball Z, you know, there's, or a lot of of animes, you know, they start out as manga books, and Hmm. then they get turned into anime, and the anime and manga sometimes have almost nothing to do with each other. They take the characters and give them another story. And then like in Dragon Ball Z, when they come out with Kai, that's a return to following the original manga as closely as possible. Hmm. So yeah. it gets pretty complicated. We'll be talking about Studio Ghibli again, Ghibli. since it'll be over at uh, the Ghibli. MFA. They're showing all the stuff there. Yeah. I'm very much looking forward I to actually to... getting over there. Yeah, I want to see a couple it. on the big screen. i got to yeah. work with Kristen. To... I think Brett wrote an article on it for uh, the, Herald. the Herald this week. Yeah, I didn't read it. Yeah. Don't you read his stuff? I didn't read that one. I, I usually read things that Brett brings to me to read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't follow. Do you follow other reviewers in the city? Do you read other I do. People? I think it's important to do that. Really? Yes, I do. Huh. I so think you it's read me. Because that's what criticism is about. So it's, 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 it's not, I mean, yeah, we do an audio version, <laughs> but I think it's important to know what other people write and, right. and the style of their writing. Yeah. Like, for example, there's, I'm He's just going to name I, names. Yeah. I'm going to like, <laughs> like Brett is very smart. Mm-hmm. I, I don't immediately identify with his style of writing. Right. My sensibility, you know, there's like a certain accessibility. There's a certain way certain people write that I like. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I try to find that when I, when I read the uh, review section of The Phoenix. Um, and and I've, I've kind of stopped reading The Dig because it just was so geared towards college students and bullshit. And I just couldn't Drunk deal with college that. college students. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I was like, I, I forget about that. But, um, you know, like when uh, if, you know, I'll read Dan Kimmel's books, I'll read uh, Ty's stuff, Wesley's stuff. I mean, I, I do make a point of, uh, you know, I'll stack the articles and get to them eventually. Right. So, you know, right. I, I used to have a, a stack of papers there over on the chair, which is basically like a stack of uh, film reviews. So I have a pretty good idea as to the style of writing, which is this is the actual product of the film critic. And I think right. it's it's important to to know that. So, you know, I started reading some of Greg Valente's stuff. Um, I would talk to Greg about it uh, at another time. He's young. It's interesting because I don't read other critics. Well, you know, that's the writing is the product, and this is the style. This is the art of film criticism. Is like, well, there's, there's, you know, we're doing it, you know, in audio form, right. which is, which is hard. Yeah, which is hard to talk about in movies sometimes. Um, but in in written form, which is basically like what the society is based on, and I'm talking about the society, you know, any film critic society or the Boston Society of Film Critics is based on your ability to write. Yeah. More so than your ability to discuss. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, th- there's even a certain talent to be being able to get on TV and talk about a movie, you know, like Ed does or yeah. like uh, Dan Kimmel did, you know, with N- uh, NECN. You know, that's hard to do. Yeah. You know, uh, I-, I read Peg's stuff, Peg Aloy's in the in the Phoenix and uh, Gerald Peary. Um, well, <laughs> you're Gerald. laughing, but you see, Gerald is really s- a smart guy. And he his film that he made, you know, for the love of movies kind of showed me where his perspective is on how to write about film. But the way Gerald, you know, writes about film is like, he's never going to be, was never going to be like Mr. Super famous film critic. Right. Cause like in order to do that, you bet it's like, you got to do what Roger Ebert does. You got to get out there and sell it. That kind of changed the way film criticism was happening in the seventies because it used to be, you know, you're, you're writing film criticism for a paper, and that's basically just what you're doing. You're focusing on the film. But Roger Ebert was doing the, the Roger Ebert package. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like this, the high-profile thing. It made it more showy mm-hmm. than the boring old dusty literary stuff. Yeah. You know, Peter's really good at keeping it real that way, you know. But he has the ability to do longer uh, pieces in the in the Phoenix. Right. You know, right. which not – 
all the you know other film critics around here don't have. But he's hmm. got the ability to be able to do a long form uh, criticism. Um, you know, and, and the other other film critics' ability to contextualize stuff. I look for that too. All right, I'm going on and on. No, so, no, it's it's interesting to me because I don't do any of that. I don't care. But I find it entertaining. I don't. You know, I don't want to read anyone else's writing. But there is there is the argument that if if in like I asked Tom Meeks about this because. Mm-hmm. I noticed that after a screening, Tom would quickly leave the theater instead of getting into a conversation with other critics after the movie. And I thought, does he think that he gets into a conversation with critics and then like his ideas are no longer his own or their ideas uh, are no longer – you, like, like you accidentally kind of use someone else's opinion or something you didn't think of without – you know what I mean? Like right. accidentally like integrating into your work. So – you know, if you see a movie and then just don't talk to anybody about it, go write it, you know, like Pauline Kael would do, then, you know, that would be your purest form of self-produced film criticism. And is, is – did Tom agree with that? No, I was, I was that? wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a thought. You know, I – I read Sean Burns, you know. I have a case. Sean, you know, doesn't, Sean doesn't know that, but, you know, I mean, he's – Sean – I, I would say he's, you know, he's got some really witty, you know, things to say, but he comes at it from a certain perspective. There's a difference between where Sean punches with his criticism and, like, say, Brett does with his or Peg. And you right. kind of you get to know what the other film critics like, you know, you know, the, where where their acerbicness is towards other things, or even if they are being like totally smart ass to a film, you know that they like it. That's what they dig. Or it can you know? be like me walking into Zombie Stripper and have Sean go, "I knew you'd be here." Yeah, but I never. John, um, you could be. You could review. Jean, uh, you could review Z- Zombie Stripper and have that review be just as entertaining as someone's review of Moneyball. True, you know. But that's all I'm trying to do when I write is be entertaining and entertained. If I'm not entertained by what I'm writing, I don't want to publish it. But I've never really had the urge to read other critics or really I don't like talking about the movie when it's over because not for any other reason besides it's over. I was there I, any film critic that you I used enjoyed to meet Jay or... Carr when I was a kid. I used to um and it was funny because I've met Jay and we're kind of friendly. Yeah. So that was but he was the Boston critic when I was in Rhode Island. So yeah. once I started writing reviews I really stopped reading everyone else. It took me that long to get my voice down yeah. and I'm happy with that. So I don't really Film good film criticism isn't easy. It's hard. I can't do it well, I didn't say all I the time good. well, and <laughs> and I and I I respect and resent other people that can do it well, and and I and I wonder where they get their inspiration to, where where they're coming from. You know, that's that's but what I'm looking for. It's all um, yeah. I don't I don't really read that much of it. You know, I read interviews Anymore. sometimes. Um, not, you know, I never really cared that much about it anyway. You know, as far as John, you have to kiss what you do for yeah. a living. You got to know what you, other people that, what I do for are living, doing. I, I did what I do. Not, for not living, that they're but... competitors, but it's just like this is there's an art to it. And I, 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 I may be delusional. I may I may no. be lying to myself to think that like, yeah, there's like people who can review stuff really quickly. And then this is the whole battle of like quantity over quality. Where right. It's just people are just shoveling bullshit reviews out there. But then there's really thoughtful stuff. You right. know, there's really. You know, you know who's put the thought in and has something relevant to say, and and like uh, you respect their knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know, like Dave Kerr when he does when he does Ooh. video pieces for the New York Times. Uh-huh. This guy writes reviews better than like for just a regular DVD, better than anybody I know. Or or, or I mean, I don't know him. I know his work. Right. But right. His name alone will make me want to just read that because he he has. There are certain film critics um, who have a depth of knowledge about film that is astounding. There are certain people considered film critics who have a depth of knowledge that is shit. That is absolutely like, that like in every they're profession. just like a fucking shysters. You know what I mean? They just don't but, know shit. But I think that all it's all a matter of of um, can they translate that knowledge into something I want to read that's enjoyable to read, or is yeah. it like reading a textbook? You know? Yeah, well, you know, yeah, it's um, true. They'll lose me when it becomes a textbook. Yeah. Uh, I used to work with a theater critic, and he was, you know, we'd go to see Cats, let's say. And he could tell me about the first day of rehearsal when Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, slipped on a banana peel, and that's how they came up with this idea. He had all that knowledge. I... 
And when I read his, I had to edit his stuff, and yeah. I'd be reading it, going, "Oh my God, stop! What did you see that night?" I, you know, ex- I totally feel what you're saying. In fact, I've gotten to a point with certain critics where it's like, in in a way, it's like me. Sometimes I have lots of bits of knowledge about certain things, and you can't just throw it all into a review, mm-hmm. you know, because it just becomes mechanical and uninteresting and pretentious because then it's because then when you get the idea that the guy writing the review or the girl is just throwing facts out there to impress you right and it's dry it's just like oh it's annoying it's like scratching the fingers on the blackboard it's like i you know it's the i know where you're coming and there's a few film critics that i still read that are like that i can't name names i won't because i I I, I don't want to there's a fine balance between someone who has a voice as a critic and someone who puts themselves in every review. But there's there's academic film criticism too. Well, that's, you know? that's a second And that's, monkey. that's. I'm just talking about, you know, regular guys who do this for a living. And there are some guys that they have a definite voice. I've worked very hard and I think I have a very definite voice when I write. And I agree there's an art to that and I work very hard at it. However, I never write a review that's all about me at the movies. Well, I think that's where criticism changed with the internet. Well, it, it, beca- it became that, it so is. casual and egotistical. But you know, you know what that, it's, you uh, know. it just kind of overwhelmed. Yeah, it's not. It's everything. not about. See, that's what that's what I like about like like Peter's film criticism that he Peter he, Keo. Peter Keo, yeah, he it's it's actually as as far as I've known his writing, it's it's not about him. Brett's film criticism is a little bit more about him. That's that's just the perspective he brings to it. But Peter's not. It's just that's you know the way they they write. But Peter has a very distinctive. No, I'm saying Brett because like uh, Brett will talk to me about this. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And so he'll nice challenge thing. me on it. You right. know. But with Peter, it's it's not like that. I don't. But Peter get also that has done. a very distinctive voice. I know if I read something he's written, it's from him. Yeah. You know. So I just again, if I'm riding the subway and there's a Phoenix there. I kind of look at the star ratings. I, le- I read movies that I haven't seen, and that's why Jerry Perry is a great critic for me because he sees movies I'll never go to. And once that in a while, is he one, yes, me that to is go one, yes, to make the effort to go see something. That, that's a thing. And I'll always say it about throat singing in Mongolia, you mm-hmm. know. And if he gives it four stars, I know it's going to be a two for me. But sometimes he's so persuasive in his argument that I'll give it a shot. Maybe when it comes on, he really, TV. he, you know, he'll love the small films. Yeah, he's carved a and, niche uh, for himself there. Yeah. Niche, a niche. Hmm. But um, where do you think you stand? Do you do you put yourself into your reviews? No, I think, but I do think I have a very distinctive voice when I write. Yeah, but I don't make it about me. I'm I have sometimes done that. And I, I'm really worried about that. Like I, it's it's a, it's like a push and pull. You know what I mean? I just, ah, uh, you know, I want to inform, but I don't want to be like, yes, yeah, that's a tough one. Just try to entertain. Know. Yeah. The rest, they'll, you know, you play the right, right notes on the flute, they'll follow you. Man, we went off on a film criticism tangent. Well, like I said, we had nothing else to talk about. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. I think we're good. All right, we're better. We've than good. done this. We're awesome. Let's put it out to pasture. <laughs> You can listen to all of our episodes online. We're at post-movie.net. And we might... I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I bought the URL, postmovie.net, and I still keep the dash in there, so... Doesn't, it doesn't redirect paying, to anything, but you're still paying for the dash site. So, <laughs> yeah. post movienet And if you have any questions, if anybody wants to send us an email, I'm laughing because how many emails do we get? I don't know. Six. You know, but uh, we are here to talk about movies. We'll talk about a movie that you've seen. You know, we'll do it on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter.com/slash Steve Head. John's not on Twitter. I don't know what's up with no, that. I, well, I'm on Twitter for work. I don't have my own account. Ah. Uh, is there I, like a Boston event guide Twitter? Boston event G, yeah. Oh, okay. And it's funny because I just got this thing called Hootsuite. Do you know mm-hmm. what this is? No. Again, I'm entering into unknown territory. It's just this uh, program that lets you monitor your tweets. <laughs> who's tweeting you? Who's retweeting you? What your scores are? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. And so using this thing, like when I wrote my interview for Sarah Paxton, yeah. I tweeted her about it. I said, hey, Sarah, here's the... Story. Oh, I she get back to you? you? No, I. But I sent it to her, the director, Universal Studios. I sent it to everyone. Uh, I tweeted them all. John, you're like more back. computer. I have savvy to, than I am now. Now that I'm going mm-hmm. in the office, this is all marketing. I have to, you know, we're trying to build some noise. Yeah. It's all about making some noise out there. So. Yeah. Um. 
If you want to make some noise on iTunes with the Post Movie Podcast, we are on iTunes. Make some noise. Yeah, and you can subscribe there and leave a review, and that would be really nice. We'd really appreciate it. We'd appreciate it, like, a lot. That's how they That's how they up your rating or something like that. <laughs> so if you're entertained, you do up. something about it. <laughs> I'm going to up your rating. We're on Facebook, too. We're still stuck at, like, 555 friends on Facebook. But anyway, let's get this over with. Until next time, I'm Steve Head. I'm John Black. So long, everybody. <laughs>